Okay, so I will continue with the inner ear disorders, a um, little bit more common disease than we have seen in the previous talks. Um, of course, we know all of these disorders quite for a long time, but uh, it seems that there are some new things coming up which may help to differentiate them. So maybe one easy approach to differentiate the peripheral vestibular disorders would be just to define three different prototypes of vestibular disorders which cause different symptoms and different clinical signs. So three different types may be possible. The one is obviously if you have a bilateral loss of your peripheral vestibular function. In this case, your main symptom may be a postural imbalance and instability of gait and oscillopia during movements, but no signs and symptoms if you sit or lie. And of course, there is some evidence that while you suppress visual system, that these symptoms get worse. So this is one prototype. The other is an acute unilateral failure of vestibular function, as we have heard several times this day. And a third may be some paroxysmal stimulation or inhibition of one vestibular organ. And this may then just present with attacks of rotatory vertigo or um, some transient uh, vestibular uh, syndromes. So these are the three prototypes of peripheral vestibular disorders. And if we want to come by more anatomic definition, of course, we can categorize the peripheral vestibular disorders by their main anatomic involvement. Starting from the very periphery, we see that, of course, the superior canal dehiscence syndrome can be caused by just dysfunction of one superior semicircular canal. Then going further, of course, we have the diagnosis of the cupula and the canaloluteasis so the benign par uh, um, paroxysmal peripheral vertigo, which also um, it happens in this compartment. We do have the endolymph hydrops, which is um, the main pathological presentation of Meniere's disease. We do have the damage to the whole labyrinth, for example, by an ICA infarct. And we do have the vestibular nerve involvement in the vestibular neuritis. So this actually is on the peripheral system and in the transition to the central system, as we heard before, there could be some vestibular schwannoma, uh, which mimics peripheral disorders or also some neurovascular contact of the vestibular nerve and some vessel, which can give you the um, picture of a peripheral vestibular disorder. So if, again, we look at the frequencies of all disorders um, of peripheral origin in all of the patients we have seen over the last few years, of course, most of the disorders are of peripheral origin, and of course, the BPPV is the most frequent one, followed then by the Meniere's disease and vestibular neuritis and some other peripheral vestibular disorders. And I will try to run through all of these different types of disorders and uh, indicate what might be new. So first of all, I want to give you some patient's history. Um, does not yeah. work. Is it always present or only in certain situations? It's always present. For instance, when I run or walk, when I climb up a mountain, when I move, and... Do you feel it while you're sitting or lying? I'm not dizzy when I'm sitting or lying. Then I have no symptoms. What is really strange is that when I climb up a mountain, I get dizzy. But when I go down, I'm not. That's very odd. When you're moving, can you recognize objects or persons well, or are things less clear than you're used to? Well, I can see things and objects and persons quite well, only when I'm walking in the street and I see some sign with writing on it, then it's blurry. Okay, so I think that's easy. Uh, you all know this is a typical picture of bilateral vestibulopathy. And what you have seen here in the last video is the subjective feeling of the patients. So that's really a disabling disease. It's not only some you know, minor um, thing, but it really disables people a lot. 
So, of course, you know that the video head impulse test may be an easy measure of the bilateral vestibular failure. Again, you see while turning the head, it's bilaterally positive, and you, of course, can also record it video-based, and you'll be even more precise in detecting some bilateral um, loss of gain. So, yes, bilateral vestibulopathy is a common disorder, and there have been some new diagnostic criteria um, based on a consensus of experts. And what is actually the notion is that you have to have a persistent postural dizziness and unsteadiness of gait, which worsens if you are walking in the dark or on uneven ground. The idea is that while you walk in the darkness, you cannot use your visual system for correcting. And same thing is on uneven ground. You cannot use your proprioceptive systems for correcting the vestibular loss. Then clinically, uh, you need to have a pathological head impulse test or some caloric hypoirrigation, and you don't have to have a better explanation for it, um, and you have to exclude, of course, central signs. And if, yes, you know the etiology, then you may further categorize what is the reason for the bilateral vestibulopathy. So we looked at the different etiologies for bilateral vestibulopathy over the last few years in about 255 patients. And it's quite frustrating because in about 50% of all of them, you won't catch any origin. So we call it then idiopathic. We don't know it better. And in only 25%, you get a definite cause, and in another 25%, some probable cause. So what is the most frequent causes? Of course, you all know that some medications, for example, antibiotics, can make a bilateral vestibulopathy. Most frequent is chantamycin, but there are some others which, in case of some renal insufficiency, can accumulate in the inner ears. And there have been also reports on other medications like diuretics or uh, even aspirin. There has been one case um, reported which may cause bilateral vestibulopathy. So you should ask in the patient's history if there's any contact with some new medication or antibiotic. Um, then the second most frequent case to our opinion is some bilateral Meniere's disease because over the years Meniere's disease may change the ear and then you may get bilateral hypofunction. So you should ask for previous uh, history of just rotatory attacks, fullness of the ears, to indicate if this could be a Meniere's disease. Uh, quite frequently also, if you get some meningoencephalitis in the young children, it often also causes an inner ear damage. It's best recognized for pneumococcal meningitis, that you get also some hearing loss and some bilateral vestibulopathy. So it could be secondary to this event. And of course, there are a lot of other different possibilities. It could be hypovitaminosis. In this case, you then have to measure the folic acid and the vitamin B12 levels. It can rarely be Kogan's syndrome, but of course, this presents with some additional signs of hearing loss and eye involvement. You need to catch these cases because if you lose them, these patients turn um, deaf and also bilateral vestibulopathic within a few weeks. So you really have to be aware if a patient comes with some acute audio vestibular syndrome on both sides and you have also involvement of the eyes and there's a rapid progression, then you should think of Kogan's um, because you only may um, intervent in the very early stage by giving corticosteroids and afterwards maybe also immunosuppressants. But of course, the regular case is that you have the older patients, year 80 plus, who come with a multifactorial um, dizziness syndrome and they regularly also have part of the diagnosis of bilateral vestibulopathy. So that's a regular case. So what can we do about it? I think it's still reasonable to try to find out if the rare case of some um, you know, treatable etiology is the case. So if you have a hypovitaminosis, then you can substitute the vitamin. Or if you have some evidence for autoimmune inflammatory inner ear disease, then you may administer corticosteroids. 
So again, that's a repetition. We ran through all of it. I don't think we have to stress it more. Most importantly, what can we do about the therapy? Because it's easy to set the diagnosis. It's not so easy to offer some treatments. Of course, what we did till now is just to advise the patients to do physiotherapy, um, balance training um, with eyes shut, with eyes open on one leg and try to fix all other sensory problems. So for example, if you have a visual problem, then just correct for the visual problem to make the reserve for compensation better. We have some new avenues of treatment also, uh, which I can just talk s slowly as uh, fastly about. So we have some new approaches of inner ear implants, so-called vestibular implants. Um, this is a development which has been driven in Genova for, and um, it is that the first patients have been implanted and it has been shown that you can restore the VOR at least for the horizontal level by these inner ear implants. So it's similar to cochlear implant, you just place the electrode near to the hair cells of your semicircular canals and then you detect head acceleration and you may stimulate the corresponding semicircular canal in a way that the uh, nerve is irrigated so that the VOR is compensated. So this is a very promising development. We are not sure if it yet contributes to uh, controlling symptoms of patients because for example the visual acuity does not improve until now, but we have to see what happens in the future. This is one avenue which may be promising. Mm -hmm. Another is that you can just, for example, uh, make galvanic stimulation using white noisy stimulation to the um, mastoid, and it has been shown last year that it improves postural control in these patients. So there are some new neuromodulatory approaches also for these disorders. Okay, again, another patient's history. Um, what complaint has brought you to us today? For dizziness, which I've had since early yesterday, ever since I got up. What type of dizziness is it? At first, it was a spinning sensation, which has abated a bit. It was simultaneously combined with strong nausea. Did you have any other complaints? No, not until then. What happened when you tried to focus on one point? Then the image began to wander and again and again to wander. In other words, I was not able to focus on one point. Besides dizziness, did you have any other complaints like seeing double, problem swallowing, difficulty speaking, paralysis or numb feeling around the mouth? No, so far not. And are you still experiencing dizziness? I still feel dizzy. It seems to have abated somewhat at the moment. I note it is, however, when walking. I have a somewhat unsteady feeling when walking or when I make a fast movement with my head. Okay, this is also maybe quite easy because if he is reporting some vertiginous feeling, some unsteadiness while going and some falling to one side and it persisted over days. Um, so this makes a vestibular neuritis very likely because the duration of symptoms um, is unlikely to be just a symptom of Meniere's disease or vestibular migraine. So actually, um, what the patient has is a vestibular neuritis, and you can, as you heard before, pick um, some Francis Googles, or this is a new invention of Michael Stroop, the so-called M-classes, which you can just use to suppress fixation, and you'll see the spontaneous nystagmus and the pathological head impulse test, and you have to be sure that you have no additional central ocular motor signs, then you can fix the diagnosis. What is most commonly seen in these patients, obviously, is some horizontal rotatory nystagmus um, together with a pathologic head impulse test, as we have heard earlier these days. So the etiology, as we heard, is most likely some inflammatory disorder, most likely due to viral infections. There has been some pathological evidence for transcripts of herpes viral or a varicella sosta viral um, infections, but we still have no in vivo proof that it is really uh, itis and it is not anything else. So treatment of symptoms. You should 
focus on three different things. Of course, what bothers the patient most in the very early phase is the symptoms. And it's, a, I have to say, mixed blessing to treat the symptoms. Because once you treat the symptoms, you may also put away the force for the following compensation. So it's the same thing as you have in other processes. If you want to make a child learn, then it's the only way to challenge and not to just rest. So you have to have some kind of symptomatic pressure in order to force the brain for getting these plasticity mechanisms into play. So therefore, it's a little bit um, controversy on how far we should go treating the acute symptoms. And I think it's quite a common um, consensus now that we should administer the treatment as um, carefully as possible and only on demand and as slow, um, as um, short as possible. So um, just use this medication like antiemetics or sedative drugs if you really need to. And if the patient is just saying, okay, I can stand it and it's okay, it's a little uncomfortable, then just let it go. It will not be good if you just try to make the symptoms um, and go down too much. The other um, approach obviously is also to think to prevent the vestibular nerve. And we've heard that preventing the vestibular nerve also means that you have to prevent the nerve from getting compressed within this uh, bony channels. So our um, standard approach to this is that we administer corticosteroids orally um, in the first few days after the vestibular neuritis. Um, it may have three different effects. It can reduce the inflammatory response. It can do a deswelling of the nerve, so it has an anti-edema effect, so you don't get secondary pressure damage to the nerve. And third, it may also be helpful for the central compensation, but that's what we were not sure about. And obviously, the third and most important thing is that we have to start vestibular exercises from, at the best, the first day of symptoms. So try to make the patient sit at the bedside or stand at the first day after the lesion, so then the whole central compensation goes faster. So this is a summary of what we could do in terms of medical treatment. So we could give some symptom um, suppressants, but we should give it very carefully, and we could give some antiemetics or we could give some sedative drugs, but be careful, you will hamper the course of the compensation. And the other avenue which we follow is that maybe some of these uh, new drugs also are helpful for improving the plasticity mechanisms in the brain. You see, this is a very, uh, f very interesting phenomenon because our patients all get better even if the peripheral vestibular function stays away. And how can it go? It can only go because the brain induces some plasticity which compensates for symptoms. So to say if we have a peripheral lesion, it's always also some central part in it. So this would be an extension on the talk about the peripheral and central interactions. It's always that the brain reacts to the sensory loss and make some plastic mechanisms. And it's been shown in animal um, experiments at least that some medications may be helpful. Um, we have proven that uh, previously, it's been published three days ago, um, that the N-acetyl-L-leucine, which is part enantiomer of the so-called tanganyl, at least in the rat model, makes an acceleration of the vestibular compensation, but by about seven days. So the animals who got this drug were at the same level at day seven than the animals who did not get on day 15. So it shortened the course of the compensation by half. Um, and it had no side effects on the long term. So maybe we will go in the future also for some pharmaceutical approaches to modulate the central vestibular plasticity and compensation processes. But still, we don't have a good evidence for that in patients. So it's just a sort what we could do. Our main regimen, so that's what you see here, 
in the data. We also did some testings in this model with beta histine um, because it's all been talked about that it may improve these central compensatory processes. And what you see here, in short, you see some three-dimensional um, image reconstruction of a rat. It's very tiny, of course, so we superimpose uh, the metabolic activity in the vestibular nuclei. And what we see if the animals receive beta histine treatment on the first day after a vestibular lesion, the metabolism in the ipsilesional vestibular nucleus goes up. So it seems um, that it is helpful to improve this rebalancing also in the central uh, entrance zone um, of the vestibular nerve. So this is just some piece, pieces of evidence. Um, what about the, the evidence for the uh, corticosteroids? So I think that the talks of the last few days have shown that not all of you give corticosteroids or you may only give it topically by injecting into the middle ear, or you may even not give it. So what is the evidence for this? The evidence actually is the best we have for all of the drugs we administer, because there have been a study in 2004 published in the New England Journal, and it was a three-branched study to compare methylprednisolone with valacyclovir and a combination of both. And what the study clearly showed is that the level of canal paresis after six months is much lower in patients who have been treated with corticosteroids during their acute phase. So it does not change probably a lot on the course of compensation, but it may improve the peripheral vestibular outcome after six months. And this can also translate to some, you know, dynamic vestibular deficits. So we think that it is helpful and it's not harmful to just give these oral methylprednisolone over the first few days after a vestibular lesion. And of course, there is some evidence, and it's also now based on a Cochrane review, um, that the postural control improves if you do vestibular exercises. So that's best level of um, evidence we have. You have to do early exercises. The same idea that you increase and challenge the patients, then you get some faster compensatory processes. Okay, so next patient. You've come to us today because of dizziness. Could you again briefly describe for me what it's like? Yes, it began last year in March. It was a very strong attack of dizziness a rotatory vertigo, a turning from the right to the left, and with pronounced vomiting. How long does the dizziness last? It depends on the attack itself, often five hours, sometimes seven hours, the strong attack of dizziness of vomiting. When it's over, my balance is disturbed for one to two days. And how often do you have such attacks? Currently, I have an attack once a week, every week at least one time. Have the attacks increased recently? Yes, last year when it began in March, I had an attack in March, then one in April, one in May, so each month an attack. Then there was nothing for three to four months. Then, since September, the attacks have occurred more often, once a week. Did you notice any additional symptoms besides dizziness, symptoms coming from the ears, from the body? When I experience dizziness, it is so strong that I can't really orient myself because I can't balance, I can't walk or do anything. But since 1994, I have tinnitus. In which ear? In the left ear. And at such times I have a feeling of pressure or the feeling that the ear is stopped up. So that's also trivial, I think, but that's one presentation, of course, you know, as Meniere's disease. And... Um, so the criteria of Meniere's disease actually have not uh, moved a lot forward since the uh, uh, initial description by Prosper Meniere. We still think um, that this is a new diagnostic criteria. You need to have more, two or more than two attacks lasting for at least 20 minutes. And you have to have a audiometrically documented hearing loss 
at least in one of these attacks with a threshold of 2,000 hertz. And uh, what is an additional criterion is that you have fluctuating tinnitus fullness or hearing sensation in the affected ear. So actually that's still what Prosper Minier also has suggested. And we do not have much more additional uh, diagnostic testing to fix it. As you know, we have difficulties to correlate the symptoms of the patients with the testing. So it can be that the REMs are pathologic or they are not pathologic. It can be that you have some caloric hypoirrigation and a normal head impulse test. So there is no good clinical test to show us the deficit in Meniere's disease. So maybe one new approach I can show you here is a contrast enhanced imaging of the inner ear, so-called Lyme imaging. It's been developed about 10 years ago and we accessed it in our clinic about eight years then. And what it actually shows is um, the perilymph system in the inner ear. It goes like this, that you inject the gadolinium to the middle ear, you wait 24 hours until it diffuses to the inner ear, and then you take fine-sliced MR images of your inner ear. And up right here, or up left here, you will see a normal presentation. So you see it's all whitish, there are no sp fluid spaces extended, it's all perilymph room. But if you look at this here, you see this um, black dots? This is a dilated endolymphatic system. And it can even increase and it can go that it's just kind of filling up the whole inner ear system. So we think that this is a approach which can in vivo really image the endolymphatic hydrops in patients with probable or possible Meniere's disease. And this is a big advantage because we now can kind of correlate it a little bit more to uh, the symptoms of the patients and it may also be helpful in the differentiation of vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease because it really seems to be more specific for Meniere's disease. Um, we currently work to kind of correlate the extent of the endolymphatic hydrops with clinical symptoms and to monitor also the effects of drugs on these endolymphatic hydrops, but this is still work ongoing. I just say that this is a quite new approach to really visualize what is going on in the inner ear. What about the therapy? You know, we've been together half a year ago in a European network meeting, and we were asking, what is your first choice to treat Meniere's disease? And it was severely different. It, in Scandinavia, it was different from the south. Some of them placed tubes um, in the ear. Others just, you know, make pressure changes. The third, they inject gentamicin. Others do gentamicin um, in both ears. And so it's real mess because everybody does something different. And what is even more complicated that everybody is really convinced that he's doing a good job. So why is it? It is probably because in all of the studies on Meniere's disease, we have a very strong placebo effect. We have a placebo effect of 30 to 40% reduction of symptoms just by any kind of intervention. So this makes it a little hard to prove in studies. But what we are quite trusting a lot in, you know, is the beta-histine uh, treatment. And this is one year follow-up study Michael Stroop did in 2008 um, where patients with Meniere's disease were followed for a year and two different dosages were compared. The one was the three times 48, which is thought to be a high dose regimen. And it was compared to three times 16 to 24 milligrams. And what you clearly could see in this data is that the higher dosage significantly reduces number of attacks more than the lower dosage. And what you can also learn on this slide is that you have to administer this medication long enough. If you just stop after one or two months, you will not have significant results in reduction of your attacks. So our advice would be you should administer the beta-histine at a high dose 
we have to talk about what high dosages are. But, you know, it, the official advice is that you should not go beyond three times 24. That's somewhat ridiculous to our um, eyes, so you can go way up. And I'll show you that there is some evidence that it really makes a difference. So high dosage means at least three times 48, and it means that you need to treat long enough, at least six months, then you have to evaluate the frequency of attacks and you have then to taper it in either way, either down or increase it if the symptoms are not controlled readily. So we're talking about high dosages. And our experience was if you steadily increase dosages, even way up uh, from three times um, 84, you have a significant dose response effect. So this observational study by Michael Stroop showed that a mean dosage of up to 480 milligram can be safely administered in the patients and that they have some significant dose response effect in terms of reduction of frequency of their attacks. And interestingly enough, there were no severe side effects and no of the patients discontinued to take the medication. So it seems that even higher dosages can be reasonable to administer if you need to do it because the um, activity of Meniere's disease is very high. So I just skip this. I want to give you a little insight on the rationale of these high dose administration. So why should this be helpful and how should it work? So the beta histine um, has been studied extensively in animal models. And one of these studies shown here has been investigating the inner ear microcirculation in guinea pigs and has just um, measured the dose effect of beta histine on the microcirculation. And just to give you a little of a um, comparison, the dosages administered here have been also used in previous animals experiment. So what did we do in this study? We prepared um, the semicircular canals, had a window and then just viewed the microcirculation within the inner ear and administered then the beta histine on different dosages. And what you can see here is that you have some curved um, increase of blood flow with increase of dosage of beta histine, which then comes to some ceiling effect um, about a dosage of 0.1 milligram per kilogram body weight. And if you try to correlate this with the dosages we administer in patients based on the assumption of metabolism, you could say that maybe 60 milligram is about here in the curve. 24 is a little higher, 48 still is in the linear part of the curve, and 160 should be at the beginning of the ceiling of the curve. So we really can say that there is some linear increase of blood flow in the inner ear still if you increase the dose up to 160 milligram. And what we have to think about again is that the half-life time of the beta histine is re really short. So you don't have an accumulation, but it's rather some acute increase of the blood flow in your inner ear. So in our opinion, it may be quite okay to just go up to these kind of dosages as a single administration. And if you take it three times a day, then you are at the 480 milligram dosages. And it's quite safe. You don't have to worry about side effects. Most of the patient will tolerate that very well. This is another study showing that also the metabolites of beta histine are pharmacologically active and they may be even more active. And the mode which is suspected is a agonist binding to the histaminergic heteroreceptor because if you block this receptor by an antagonist, you will lose the effect to the blood flow. So it's quite sure that it's binding to the histamine receptor. So therefore, we're moving up the ladder, and we just are in our clinic uh, now administering three times 96 milligram, three times a day, and we would be willing to taper it up if necessary. And this will be also 
um, supported by the drug companies who are preparing tablets with 100 milligram and even 300 milligram of beta histine in the moment. So I think we have to move in this direction. And up to our opinion, this is a very reasonable first approach because other kinds of interventions, for example, the gentamicin injections may have some severe side effects to the auditory system. And of course, you have a destructive mode in this. So if you just administer gentamicin to the affected ear, fine, it will work. But what then if the Meniere's disease changes sides five years later, what do you do then? So you have to be aware that it is most of the time not only a disease of one ear, that within the course of disease it can change sides to the other side. And then you are better off giving some systematic um, treatment which may also um, work at the non-affected or subclinically affected ear. So this is one of the rationales for the medication. And what we think is not effective also based on studies is salt-free diet, diuretics, or endolymph sac operation. Um, it may be in very rare cases, but I think our options are better uh, with the medications and some other kind of interventions. Okay, here you see another patient. The question is, what is it? You know, what could this be? Yes, this is the patient is actually a frog here, you know, and this is um, the um, preparation of some um, semicircular canal and you see here this little um, piece of calcium ortholytes going down the system. So this is BPPV in the frog, you know, we could not ask the frog if he's dizzy, but it seems um, that it is a good model to show what happens really in the in the ear during uh, BPPV. And what we can learn also is that these uh, little crystals, they move quite slowly. Um, and this is important also for our clinical estimation. So it's not as you drop a bar of iron in the air and it just goes down rapidly. But it's more like a little piece going in heavy oil. It's just kind of really rigid and it goes down and it reaches only the fastest phase of acceleration after a few seconds. So we can understand why we have to wait while doing the positioning maneuvers because it has to take time that the crystals move. Of course, the clinical examination, this is Michael Stroop, by the way. He just wants to give the warmest regards and he is here in the video section. So, um, what you can do um, is that you do these well-known um, simu maneuvers. You can even shake the head a little bit, but at times it makes um, evoke these symptoms a little bit. And obviously, most of the time, you can see the typical crescendo, decrescendo, uh, nystagmus lasting for one minute. And if the patients come up again, they feel like you know they get tilted backwards. And this is the typical presentation of a posterior channel BPPV nostagmus during the Zemo maneuver. But I think you all know how it looks like. It's just some competition um, of what you know. So what is the typical history? We all know it's recurrent attacks of vertigo. They're triggered by changes of body position. And they last to up to one minute and you get these very typical findings in the positioning maneuvers um, with a rotatory vertical nystagmus beating towards the um, downward ear, and it ceases after one minute. So this is a little of a, you know, animation, what really happens. You get some out of view of the semicircular canal, and whenever the head position changes, you get these little crystals moving down and making some deviation of the hair cells in your ampulla. And then if you wait for some few seconds and all these crystals, the autoconia, then uh, come to the deepest point, this deviation um, is stopping. And if you just position to the other side, it's going in the other direction. So that's our thinking. 
about um, this kind of uh, pathomechanisms. Of course, very importantly, gravity needs time. Take your time. Um, the specific weight of the autoconia is about 2.71 gram per um, centimeters um, square, so it needs time. If you really are too hurry up with uh, diagnosis, then you just may um, lose a portion of these uh, patients. So the liberation maneuver, I think it's quite clear. I'm not sure if we have to go through it. Um, maybe we show it once um, to get it a little bit more systematic, what happens during these kind of maneuvers. So first step is turn the head to the shoulder. This is because you have to position your posterior canal in the level of your um, movement of the body afterwards. And what happens then is that the otolids are at the deepest point of these semicircular canals. Then you start with the first step just moving by 90 degrees down to the um, floor. And what happens is you see the typical nystagmus, no doubt. And you will see that the otoconia move by about 90 uh, degrees to the deepest point of the semicircular canal. Um, so you move them by 90 degrees into the right direction by just doing this kind of positioning maneuvers. See, the um, otoconia run down to the deepest point, so you have them 90% out or 90 degrees out of the um, of the canals. And then most importantly, what you have to do is just really go to the other side very fast um, and just hold the position of the head like this. You'll see in case that it works, uh, nystagmus which then beats up to the upper ear. This is a liberation nystagmus and it shows that you were effective. Um, the patients will also report that they have, again, some vertigo, so you know that works. In terms of the system, you just kind of make the thing bottom up, and then the autoconia pass the highest point, and they fall out by the free arm of the semicircular canal, and then you will be effective. If you then go back to the upward position, um, the autoconia fell out and the patients at times report a little of feeling of dizziness and being back pushed. So this is a quite a typical presentation um, if you are successful with these liberation maneuvers. So the actual question is where do the autoconia come from? Do we know where they come from? It's all anatomy, right? Um, so if we just uh, take a look at the anatomy of the inner ear, these are the open sides of the semicircular canals. This is the utricle, and this is the saccule. And the saccule is divided from the utricle by a small endolymphatic duct. So it's most likely that the autoconia come from the utricle and from there fall into the open arms of the semicircular canals it's highly unlikely that they come from the saccule. So how could you prove that? It, you can prove it, um, and it's been a study also recently finished, um, by doing VAMPs, because the OVAMPs will measure the otricle, and if you do that just before and after the positioning maneuvers, you will see that the amplitude of the VAMPs um, increases after you did the positioning maneuver and then goes back to normal. So this shows that, you know, the um, autoconia may move back to the utricle and may change uh, the amplitudes of the OVAMPs so that you can um, estimate that there's some change um, in some refixation. Also very interesting new development, um, and this is in honor of Professor Kim, who was the first to um, describe these mechanisms. So we have to think what makes the BPPV happen. Of course, it can be a head trauma and it can be immobility and there are several cases. 
It can be some other inner ear disease. It can be secondary to neuritis and Meniere's disease, yes. Um, but what has been a common finding in patients, at least with recurrent BPPV, is that most of them had a deficiency of vitamin D. And this really makes a lot of sense if you think about vitamin D as some um, hormone-like um, substrate which stabilizes the calcium metabolism. So this also could be the case in the otolith's organs. So if you have a vitamin D deficiency, maybe the otoconia are a little bit, bit more prone to fall off. And actually, there is some evidence from animal models and there are some uh, clinical studies running in Professor Kim's center um, to test really the benefit of a vitamin D administration to um, prohibit some recurrent BPPV. So the idea would be um, to administer it after the first attack so that you can reduce recurrency of BPPV. And it may be promising, so we'll see what the study results um, will show. So this is another patient. Um, he's lying in flat position. And you turn the head to the horizontal side, and you see here some geotropic nystagmus, purely horizontal, which then loses strength a little bit. And if then you just see the patient is turned now to the other side in a second, you'll see that the same thing occurs also when turning the head to the other side. So again, you'll get this horizontally beating positional nystagmus. And it can be very severe. So at times, if you're not familiar with this kind of disease, people will be administered to the stroke units because it looks really a little strange. You know, the changing direction of nystagmus, the latencies, and so on but I'm sure you're the better doctor, so what is your diagnosis? Horizontal. Horizontal BPPV, definitely. And is it in the channels or is it more in the cupola? Channels, channels exactly. So this is um, horizontal BPPV channel oliteasis. And um, the clinical hallmark is that you have a positional nystagmus, which is purely horizontal and which is beating in a geotropic direction, so down to earth. And the intensity may be higher um, on the side which is affected, um, and the mechanism is a autoconium moving freely in the channel. So it may be also another presentation which you see here. Um, just take a look again at the direction the eyes go. You see it again positioned to the side, and this time the nystagmus beats away from Earth, so agiotropic, but still is quite horizontal in direction. And same thing is if you just change the side, you will see the same thing. So actually, this is an even more rare presentation of a cupulolithiasis of the horizontal um, semicircular canal. So if we would take frequency of all of the BPPVs, um, about only 10% will happen in the horizontal canal and 90% in the posterior canal. And there is some strange preponderance to the right side. So even for the posterior canal, a little bit more to the right than to the left side. For the horizontal canal, the Cupulolithiasis is even very rare. I would say at, at the most one third of cases of a horizontal BPPV are due to a cupulolithiasis. So you see again horizontal beating, ageotropic, and now the lower um, beating velocity may indicate the affected labyrinths. So what is the proper treatment or which treatment could we administer for these patients? So one of these is barbecue, and this is actually 
quite um, the right term. So uh, the patient is always turning by 90 degrees over the longitudinal axis and waits for one minute in each position. And um, then goes back and you just kind of uh, restart the maneuver again. And you see you always turn along the non-affected ear over the longitudinal axis. This is a very efficient maneuver. Um, but then you should know the right direction and you should know the affected side. Uh, maybe an alternative could be the Gufonis maneuver, um, which is also effective and it does not depend as much on identification of the right side. Um, that's, a, that's an open question. So it has been published in a way that they said it's perfect and you do not need to have anything else. It's just the best maneuver. I'm not sure if we can um, go with this kind of data. So I think it's not bad, but it's not a 100% perfect maneuver. So other options are barbecue. Other options is just lying in bed overnight on one side. It's also effective. And fortunately, most of the horizontal BPPVs, at least due to canalolithiasis, get better by their own. So it falls out at some time point and then they get better at their own. We have to consider one rare condition which has been published several times, that if you have a canalolithiasis of the horizontal semicircular canal, you can also have spontaneous nystagmus to the other side and you can have a pathologic head impulse test. So if you then don't look thoroughly and you just take it, you know, by a quick view, then you have a spontaneous nystagmus, a Halmagis test, and you say, okay, it's a vestibular neuritis. But it is not, because you have a very pure horizontal beating direction, and if you do then the positioning maneuvers, of course, you will see um, the positional nystagmus. But just of note, because I also was close to missing one because I just was saying, okay, everything is clear. Um, the pathophysiological concept may be that by these um, otholiths um, or autoconia, the canal is blocked. It's blocked, so you have some asymmetry in tone, and even if you do a very um, fast accelerations, you may have a functional deficit of the horizontal canal. So let's hear another story. What are your major complaints? I have recurrent attacks of vertigo. How long do they last? Two until four minutes. When did the symptoms begin? In January this year. Mm -hmm. How many attacks did you have over the last month about? I would suppose 500 attacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite often, right? So. If you hear this story, there's almost no differential diagnosis. So there are very frequent attacks um, lasting for only a few seconds to minutes. So what would be your consideration? What could be the diagnosis? He does not, he says it can happen while he's turning the head, but that's not regularly the case. It can just happen incidentally and it comes 10, 20, 50 times a day at certain times. Yes, exactly, that's vestibular paroxysmy. And um, the criteria for this is that you have to have at least five attacks lasting for seconds to minutes, and um, you don't have a very good um, explanation by just head turnings, and you can have all different kinds of you know, tinnitus or some transient hearing loss. So the history does not really um, make a big difference other than that you have a lot of attacks and that they are quite short. Um, so what is the pathophysiological correlate for this kind of vestibular paroxysm? Compression. Compression, exactly. And actually this has been the first case to document this in, in vivo, so by surgery. See up here you have the um, inner ear um, um, for Raman and from there the vestibular cochlear nerve comes in and there you have this uh, contact with a, um, with a loop of the vessel and it compresses the vestibular nerve. See here is the intraoperative picture. You have this vascular loop around the nerve 
and after decompression you see here that it's demyelinated because it's not as white, it's a little brownish. So this means that just by the compression you get some functional demyelinization and from that you get some apeptic um, irrigation of the nerve. And it can happen if you turn the head or whenever and it happens regularly. So it's similar to what we know, for example, for trigeminal neuralgia or from um, facial, facial spasms, hemispasms. So these are all vascular neuronal compression syndromes. And um, the good point on it is that it perfectly responds to medication. So if you have the suspicion that the patient could have a stipular paroxysmia, um, and you may have some evidence from the cis images of the MRI, you could administer some treatment, preferably, for example, with um, carbamazepin or oxcarbazepin. You will have a rapid decrease of the attacks. I would even say that this is the best way of evaluating the diagnosis, that if you got a good response to these kind of medications, it's quite proven that it is a vestibular paroxysm, and if you have not, it's very unlikely to be if the patient takes the medication and it's administered in a high enough dosage. The MRI, I have to say, this is again the story, don't make a miracle out of it because we have a lot of patients who have just some vascular contact to the nerve and they don't have any symptoms. So it's not that you can really make the diagnosis out of an MRI. It's just some additional evidence and some ruling out of some a tumor, for example, or vestibular schwannoma, which can have similar uh, presentations. And that's some, um, you know, previous study in PrEP where they showed that uh, also for oxcabazepin, um, the number of attacks has been reduced quite rapidly. So patient history, again, can be very um, diffuse. Um, the main criterion is that you have a very short-lasting attack which comes again and again. And all of the vestibular testings, unfortunately, can be positive or not. You can have some vestibular irrigation deficit, but it is not really helpful to make the diagnosis. Okay, so maybe let's summarize um, that the most frequent peripheral vestibular disorders um, contribute to 90% of all of forms of peripheral vestibular vertigo. We have to consider at least seven or eight diagnoses. Most important, the benign paroxysmal positional vertigo of all terms. We have to exclude that it is a central origin by just doing a proper exam and try to alineate the nystagmus with the affected semicircular canal. Um, Meniere's disease, um, we have some new diagnostic tools from imaging and maybe some promising pharmaceutical agents with the beta histine. The vestibular neuritis, um, the most acute form of persistent unilateral neuropathy. It's important that you challenge the patients very early in the course and we advise to administer corticosteroids. Bilateral vestibulopathy can be ethiopathic and we just are at the moment um, sticking to doing physiotherapy, but it may be in the future that we get inner ear prosthesis. Vestibular paroxysmia um, is a rare disorder, but very easy to treat with anti-epileptic drugs, so you should not oversee it. And I did not talk about paralymph fistula, but it's a condition where you have some vertiginous feelings while changing pressure or doing Valsalva maneuvers, and you could possibly do surgery on it, but it's quite complicated. So thank you very much, and I look forward for the discussions.